think that you're the perfect person to start. Oh, with. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, appreciate I really that. appreciate you taking the time out of your crazy schedule. <laughs> I've been talking to a few students lately and I keep running into this same theme that mm -hmm. there's kind of a combination of inspiration yeah. and then the discipline to use that inspiration mm -hmm. for it seems like all of you. So for the inspiration side, can you just talk about where you came from? What made you decide to take this path? Yeah. So I was born in Iraq and I uh, left when I was six years old with my mom because of war and because she couldn't um, be saved there anymore. We both couldn't be saved there anymore. So we moved to Syria and we stayed there for four years and things started getting bad there too. So we moved to Lebanon and we were there for four years. And then my aunt who lives in Richland, Washington, um, at the time she was getting sick and she needed more support. She's older than my mom and she's her only sister. So she talked about us coming here to be each other's support system. And that's what we did. We started the process uh, when we got to Lebanon and it did take four years and we made it here. What really inspired me to look into medicine, um, my mom, she is a pediatrician. She worked as a pediatrician in Iraq. That's where she graduated from. And as a little kid, I just remember like running around the hospital with her. <laughs> that, was, that was my experience there. And um, part of her um, career, she opened a clinic at our house and she was helping um, people in underserved communities. She thought that being at the hospital is not enough and there was a lot of needs. So she went ahead and opened a clinic and um, she just was going above and beyond to support people. And it was always about medicine and helping people. It was never about the payment or keeping the clinic going. I think there was a time where she was even in debt, but what was important is keeping the clinic open. So. That I even as a little kid, I would look at that and be like, "Wow, I didn't know what it's like to serve an underserved community, but um, I saw my mom doing it, and even though I didn't know what it meant at the time, it just was really beautiful to see how many people she was helping. So that was the beginning of it. didn't didn't make a lot of sense at the time. It was just like looking at my mom and be like, "Wow, I want to be like you when I grow up." Yeah. And then we when we came here, and I went to high school in Richland. I went to WSU Tri Cities, across the street, <laughs> and I started thinking about medicine. And I went and had an internship at Cadillac where I got to work with a DO. Didn't know what a DO was at the time. I just started working and I saw how she treated her patients. And I worked with other doctors too. And I remember at the end of my internship, going to her and saying, you really treat people as a whole and you pay attention to every detail and you pay attention to um, their family, their lifestyle, every aspect of their life as an emergency physician. And, and I haven't seen that a lot. And um, she made the comment saying, well, that's what a deal is all about. And I didn't know what a deal is. So I asked and she told me about her experience and school and education and I got interested in DO specifically. I was a sophomore at WSU Tri Cities and I thought, well, I wanna stay in state. I moved a lot in my life, I don't wanna move again. So um, I was like, well, maybe my only option is UW. I wanna go to UW, that's where everybody wants to go. Mm -hmm. um, at least around me at the time. Sure. I decided, okay, well, maybe DO is not what I can do right now. And I remember a representative from PNW coming to WSU Tri-Cities and um, I took his business card and and I forgot about it because I was a sophomore and um, I wasn't applying yet and then my junior year I took the MCAT and on my way back home we passed by Yakima and I told my mom she was with me and I said well um, I remember there is a school here in Yakima like do you want to go check it out and we came here, I had a tour, and I start, like, as I was walking around my junior year, I start looking at different spots on campus and seeing myself. It was a weird feeling. Um, seeing myself studying in this spot or seeing myself walking, seeing myself having lunch here, actually. <laughs> and 
I didn't make a lot of sense out of it. I was like, oh, it's just, you know, a beautiful campus and maybe I will be here, maybe I'll be somewhere else. And then we went to the anatomy lab and my first thought was like, oh, it's not in a basement. Yeah. <laughs> anatomy lab sometimes in basements, especially in old schools. Mm. And the person that was giving us the tour, he said, yeah, that's our selling point is that our <laughs> anatomy lab is not in a basement. Yeah. And after that tour, I applied to medical school, um, including PNWU, didn't get in. And I was a little discouraged. Um, just like every medical student that gets rejected. I imagine. <laughs> and I went into my senior year, graduated, and I remember talking to my advisor at the time and she started talking about plan B and I, it just didn't feel right. I said, well, I don't want to have a plan B. I only have one plan and I want to be a doctor and that's it. And after exploring other thoughts and other ideas, I thought, well, maybe it's not a plan B necessarily, but it's another plan that gets me to plan A. <laughs> so I heard about uh, Heritage and how they're um, working with PNWU and having this master's program in medical sciences where it's a one-year program, you do it, and you get an interview with PNWU if your scores are high enough, specifically in, in one class that you take with medical students. Applied for the program, it was during COVID, so I did it online. After that, I interviewed for PNWU. I remember it was in January, two weeks before my birthday and I didn't know how the interview went. <laughs> I had mixed feelings about it, and two days before my birthday, I got the phone call that I got in, and I was driving, and I just, like, start crying. I, every time I remember that day and when I got the call, I just get chills because you never forget that call. And I remember calling my mom and just telling her that I got in, because throughout this whole whole process, taking the MCAT, undergrad, all of it, she was there. She was always my support system. Every time I had a test or anything, she took off all the responsibilities off my chest and and I just needed to study. That's the only thing I needed to do. Your mom must have been so proud of you. When she heard that it was this school, did she know about the mission of it? Coming from the sort of background that she did, caring for people mm -hmm. who were probably as underserved as you could get and yeah. sacrificing herself to make sure that those people had care mm -hmm. when you hear that this place is specifically dedicated to caring for that very group of people and then yeah. it has the the principles those DO principles that you talked about of treating a person mm -hmm. like a whole person that must have been amazing to she must have that it means more I would imagine yes you find that yeah. out. you said you wouldn't be here without her she wouldn't be here without you either because that support system continued, right? True. Yeah, we moved to Yakima in August and um, she moved with me to, again, just do everything and not let me worry about a thing. And unfortunately, going into September, things start changing. Um, so she worked as a medical interpreter and her job was still in Tri-City, so she was going back and forth. And and then her, her health start um, declining and we didn't know why we went to different doctors and she my mom thought that it's due to other diseases that she had um, rheumatoid arthritis diabetes and um, doctors start talking about the possibility of multiple myeloma which is a blood cancer and at the time she said that it's not that you know Labs could look similar when you have autoimmune disease. Um, I don't want to look into that. I don't have cancer. I want to keep working. And I remember going with her to medical appointments and her doctor saying, you need to do a biopsy. You need to do those certain labs. And she just didn't want to do them. And she was still in her treatment. So she wasn't, um, she was on her treatment for other um, diseases. And she wasn't the one to like, refuse treatment. Um, but a lot of the records were saying that is that she was refusing treatment mm. and um, I didn't think anything of it I said well you know she doesn't want the lab so that goes into she's refusing treatment fast forward to January 
things are getting really bad. Now she's in, uh, she has anemia and she's lethargic. She's on pain medication. She can't walk or work like she used to be. And our roles start switching where I start having the responsibility of taking care of both of us. And she still didn't want to get more medical care. She was getting tired and um, what she knows about multiple myeloma is that there's no cure for multiple myeloma. Um, it just, you just keep taking treatment and it may work, it may not work, it can get aggressive. And when she did her medical education, uh, any cancer was very hard to treat. And her doctors were talking about how things are really different for multiple myeloma, but um, there wasn't a lot of explanation. There wasn't a lot of let's sit down and talk in details about this. I think part of it because almost every physician has that 30 minute constraint. It's like, I will meet with you in 30 minutes and I will get the information I need and make a decision and move on and it's part of the system. So she never had that chance to just sit down and explain details, what she's scared about and what she knows and what is new now and what can be done about it. Um, in April, two weeks before my finals, that's when she got really sick. And um, she had some laps and they called us in the middle of the night and they told us that her hemoglobin level was really low. And when that's really low, then People are confused, lethargic. Um, they could pass out and die because they don't have enough oxygen going to their brain. And I remember driving her to Cadillac at 11 p.m. not knowing, she wasn't even talking to me at the time. She was really tired that she wasn't even talking. And I just remember being really scared driving to Cadillac and not knowing what the results will be. And, um, the emergency physician that saw her that night um, did admit her for a blood transfusion and, and then they did a CT scan and it showed a lot of fractures from the myeloma. So um, he looked at us and he said, I don't, and, and leading to that, there were a lot of medical appointments where they were asking her to do a biopsy so they can confirm it's multiple myeloma. Mm -hmm. And when we got to the ER and all this happened, the um, emergency room physician was like, I really don't need a biopsy to tell you this is myeloma. It, all the signs are there, everything is there. Um, so she got admitted, um, she saw an oncologist, the oncologist still wanted a biopsy, and she just didn't feel comfortable doing it. And um, again, it was to that, well, if you don't get the biopsy, there's no treatment. We can't treat without the biopsy. So the, our other option was get discharged from the hospital on hospice. My mom is 54, pretty young to be on hospice and, and with myeloma. What I, what I found out about myeloma is that it's, yes, there's no cure, but it can be controlled and for a lot of years. Um, and we left the hospital on hospice. And when I was leaving, I remember palliative care telling me that I probably have a few weeks and if not less. So we came back home and I didn't know what to do. I have two weeks left of school. No one at school knows what's going on and I, I don't know what to do. Do I stop and take care of this? Do I spend whatever time I have left with her if I have any? Um, and I decided to reach out. Part of it because I start, I was missing exams and I was missing quizzes and I reached out to one of the faculty members um, and I told him what was going on finally and he just paused and he said, you have been dealing with this all year? And I didn't realize that I should have reached out sooner. I just didn't think I knew it was an option, but I just didn't think there's anything to be done. Like, they're not gonna stop medical school for me. And we all say it, it's like, you go through medical school and life doesn't stop. People are gonna get sick, people will get married, will go on with their lives. And sometimes being in medical school just feels lonely. It's like, you're on this journey with your classmates, but we're isolated from the world. And he gave me options. He said, no, there are options. There, there are all those things that we can do. You can 
take time off, you can postpone your test, you can take it again in the summer. And, and I really, even though I was going through all this, I really didn't want to take time off because I didn't know what the summer holds. Mm. And I want it to be done with as much as I can, as soon as I can. You've gotten so far. At this <laughs> yeah. I only have two weeks left. Yeah. And uh, there were some of my classes I was at risk of failing them. And I remember two of the faculty members telling me, well, we are going to wait until you make that decision and we'll support you in whatever decision you make. Even though they were really hesitant, they're like, you should take the time off. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know if you can go through two weeks of finals. Um, but I went back and I said, I want to take my test. If, if I don't pass, then it's the same result. I have to do it again in the summer. Mm -hmm and um, I went through it and during my finals week we were having visits from hospice care and they were having very difficult conversations. Some of it I would say was not very culturally appropriate. They were doing their job and I get it and they were very compassionate but in my culture we don't have a lot of conversations about death. That's a, that's a topic that's not discussed very openly and when the hospice nurse was coming over and the case manager they were talking about well how do you want to die and how do you want that process to go and both my mom and i were not handling this conversation very well um and i was like coming between classes to talk to them <laughs> it, it was it was tough and she decided after a few of those conversations that she doesn't want to be on hospice and I think part of it, she didn't really um, know what hospice is. Um, she knew more about palliative and she thought hospice is the same thing. And after their few visits, she decided I don't want to be on hospice. And I didn't know what our backup plan because she still doesn't want to do the biopsy. But I just followed her lead throughout this journey. I just followed her lead she wanted to get discharged from the hospital, I did what she wanted, which was hard because sometimes it was going against medical advice. But I remember when she was at Cadillac, she told me, I want you to learn this early on. I know I'm your mom, but I want you to learn to listen to your patient. And if I'm telling you that, sorry, I'm getting emotional. Okay. Um, if I'm telling you that I, I don't want this and I want to go home, then do that for me. It doesn't matter if it doesn't matter what the book says. <laughs> um, and that just played in my head over and over again um, in times where there were times where she wasn't able to make a decision. And I just had to go back to what she told me before she got um, sick or confused. And um, I followed her lead again. We got off hospice and then she remembered that she worked with an oncologist as a medical interpreter a few years back and she reached out to him and uh, he he's from jordan so he's from the middle east mm -hmm. and she was able to have an open conversation about everything like her fears and why she refused the biopsy he had both of us on the phone and he asked me when my last final is and i said oh it's on this date and he said okay well i'm scheduling my mom your mom to come visit me on the day after your finals and we're gonna get start treatment and he even said so they gave her blood transfusion and they he told me you have 14 days exactly 14 days and she her hemoglobin level is going to drop again and that's when i'm going to see her that's where we're going to do an, another blood transfusion and we'll start treatment and um he didn't say, he still wanted the biopsy, but he didn't say anything on the phone. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom was really happy. And um, after finals, um, I walked out of my last final and I was like, wow, I passed everything. It, it was just this weird feeling of, I was just in disbelief, in disbelief that I passed my classes. And now I have all this summer to take care of my mom and she's not on hospice. And I don't have to think that I don't have any hope. And because that's what it was. When we were on hospice, I just felt there's no hope. There's only one way. Um, even though I had faith, but still, it's, just, it's one way. They're not going to treat whatever happens. And there are just certain facts that I can't ignore. Um, 
And then after my finals, we went and had that medical appointment and he talked about the biopsy, but he did start treatment. He said, you know, traditionally insurance would not approve any medications or any um, procedures relating to myeloma without the biopsy. And there are certain things that I would not be able to know if I don't do the biopsy. And she, the biopsy did get scheduled, but she kept asking me to postpone it. The insurance did approve the medication and the treatment without the biopsy. So that was another sign for her. I was like, well, I don't want the biopsy. <laughs> and she had her other doctors saying like, no, you need the biopsy. And she went through the summer with treatment, three months of treatment. She was getting better. She was getting more alert. Um, she gained her, some of her health back. And I got a lot of people ask me, it's like, what are you gonna do for a second year? Because you can't be her primary caregiver. I didn't have a lot of support. I had a lot of support from my classmates and specifically one that just was making sure I study and she um, asked her fiance to help and he was staying with my mom and it was just a lot of support from faculty, from classmates, everybody reaching out to me and getting groceries and helping us with everything. But still, somebody that is helping me taking care of her um, and being there at home with us, that was missing. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have options for caregiving. It was like a month before school started. And um, again, there was a talk about, do you want to take this year off? And I considered it mm -hmm. because I, I didn't know I can do this again. And I remember talking to my mom. We sat down and I said, there's this option that I could take the year off. And without me finishing the sentence, she was like, no, you're not gonna take the year off. We're gonna do this together. <laughs> and I told her what it would mean. It would mean that I would have to get a caregiver and I can't be her primary caregiver. Um, and she, we would have to lie on other people for support and I may not be there as much as she want me to be. And she said, yeah, but I want to be at your white coat ceremony. I want it to be this year. And I, without knowing how I would do it, I said, yes, I'm gonna start this year and um, we'll take it one step at a time. One week before school started, her treatment got transferred here with an amazing doctor. We found a caregiver and again, a lot of support <laughs> and just things were falling into place right before school started. And they're not perfect right now. And I still sometimes miss class or feel really behind on school or feel like I'm not doing enough at home, but we're doing it. And she's still my support system, even though she's going through all this. It's amazing. You're way beyond plan B at this point, but you're still <laughs> at plan A. And yes. it's the same with your mom. And I love that in our earlier chats, you kept saying, and it seems to go through the thread of your whole story, mm -hmm. if there's more than one way. You can mm -hmm. get to plan A by taking plan H or yeah. Z, and you're at like triple Z at this point, <laughs> but you're still here at A. What does your mom think now that this is approaching the, the reality that you're coming toward a, a white coat ceremony, that you're in your second year of medical school, that you have a first year of training behind you and yeah. you accomplished it with that's going through the fire and you made it mm -hmm. through the fire and you're sitting here now yeah it she is she's really proud and it's she told me yesterday after our second renal exam that uh, me going through this year it's what keeps her going because she's not able to work and do anything right now and she's mostly staying at home and even though it is very hard for her that I'm not there most of the time and I have to study for long hours and she misses me and sometimes she feels like she doesn't have that support. But when I come back and tell her that I pass a test or I did good on a quiz, it gives her hope again. And it was just really beautiful to hear that and know that somehow, even though I am really busy, I can still be there for her and, and give her that. I always feel like, uh, and it's tough to, to think this way when mm -hmm. you're going through the, the trials and tribulations mm -hmm. of life, but your hardest times are often the greatest blessings. 
mm. and they're seeing your mom take care of the sort of people that she did while you were growing up and the selflessness that she displayed mm. and then coming into a spot where you were seeing your mom need care while you are becoming a doctor is just an amazing combination of inspirations yeah. again. How has this experience shifted the way? When you came in, you were excited. I remember talking to you and you saying, I want to ace every test and I want to join every club and I want to do everything here. Yeah. I imagine that now seeing what uh, one compassionate caregiver could do to change a life mm -hmm. must have shifted the way that you think about the profession that you're going yeah. into. Definitely, it definitely did. A lot of my perspectives changed. Um, I did, coming in, I did have the belief that yes, I should listen to my patient and not follow the system word for word or follow the book for, word for word. And even they tell us here, not every patient reads the book. Mm -hmm. And it's very true. We learn in um, sometimes in a black and white way um, because that's what we need. We need to have an answer for the test. If we have a question, we need to, to have the right answer. And in life, sometimes that can be different. If I have a question, I will go back to the biopsy. But if I have a question on the test, and they're like, "This patient presented with X, Y, and Z, and it looks like cancer. What is your next step?" And most of the time, it is getting a biopsy. Mm -hmm. And then we go out to the real world, and then we have patients saying they don't want it. And it's a gold standard, but there are other ways. If our patients are really uncomfortable with this procedure, what are our options? Plan B. And what is plan B? What are we going to do? Do we leave them without treatment? And um, before my mom's care got transferred to Yakima, I had a conversation with her oncologist, and I was really inspired by him because. Um, he asked me once he transferred her care and we had an appointment with the oncologist here. He was like, did the new oncologist think I'm crazy for not doing a biopsy? <laughs> and I was like, no, he didn't say anything. He was just surprised. And he said, you know, there is an exception for every rule. And I couldn't let your mom get sicker and possibly not be in your life um, just because I, I really want a biopsy and I want to have all the answers and the perfect answers. I could look at my Loma labs and determine if she's getting better. It's not going to be perfect, but that's what she wants. She doesn't want a perfect treatment. She wants treatment and she wants it in a certain way that help her have a longer life, but not necessarily the step-by-step -step treatment and the um, end result of a 100% cure. She was, and he said that that's, that's what I gave her and sometimes you just have to go with what your patient wants. And I was just really inspired by it. And I, and just last week we had uh, a class a lecture with Dr. Brady, who is our oncologist here on campus. And he said, he was talking about a case where the patient did not, um, did not have surgery. All his phys physicians were saying, um, we can't do the surgery, it's impossible. And then one physician did it, and Dr. Brady ended the lecture with saying, one person impossible is another person challenge and opportunity to grow. And it just took me back to my mom's story. It was, she had, she had really great physicians, uh, but some of them were set on certain procedure and certain protocol. And one said, it's not impossible to do this. We were, back in the day when we didn't have biopsies, we still treated myeloma, so it's doable. And it's, it's just changed my perspective. Now, when, when I graduate and go out to the real world, if a patient show up and they don't want a certain procedure or they don't follow the book, I can push myself to think outside the box and think about what other options I can do and what steps I can take to respect their wishes. I find that many times uh, people who are hesitant to do anything mm -hmm. are typically hesitant because they're fearful and many times that fear comes from a lack of familiarity. Right. And when you're working in a community mm -hmm. uh, like an underserved community, yeah. the definition of underserved is essentially they haven't had much experience with medical caregivers mm -hmm. and so they're naturally 
probably fearful of the things that they haven't had much experience with. Yeah. And so the patients that you're going to see one day, many of them are probably going to reflect these same stories and these same hesitations that your mom has. Yeah. And now you can be that person who understands that mm -hmm. the hesitation isn't a closed door. That yeah. hesitation is a peek into the person that you're carrying. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it's, um, it does come from fear and not being familiar with the procedure or being familiar with a procedure that went wrong. I, and that was the case for my mom. Mm -hmm. She went, she can tell me stories of um, how similar procedures went wrong. And they were done for different reasons and for um, different cancers. So I tried to explain that it's different, but still it, that fear was there. And the medical staff that she had before her oncologist did not dig deep into it. it and part of it, it's a system, they're busy. They, are, they don't have the time necessarily to dig into everybody's fear. But that's what I want to do when I graduate. <laughs> I want to get into that next. So you're in second year now. Yeah. And you're approaching third and fourth mm -hmm. in graduation and yeah. your white coat ceremony at the end of this year, rotations next year, where you get to really go out and start working with people. Mm -hmm. From inspiration, obviously you have the discipline that is taking you through this course. Yeah. What are your aspirations what do you hope to take from all of this to give to others I want to continue to learn to listen and just be there for my patients and take everything I learned and do it with compassion again just know that patients are not going to read the book they don't care what the protocol is and they they just want to feel better Sometimes they don't even care about what they have and, and they don't understand it, but they want us to make them feel better. And I really hope that I can get to a point where I do take the time to sit down and have those conversations with my patients. Um, one of my interests is emergency medicine and part of it because that's where I had my internships. That's where I, before medical school, I worked as a crisis counselor. So I was really close to that emergency medicine aspect of the medical field and um, and then seeing my mom go through it and if it wasn't for that emergency physician emergency room physician admitting her and saying this is my mom I'm calling an oncologist um, she wouldn't have started she wouldn't have been on this journey as difficult as it was to start and be on it so I have other interests, but I go back to, well, whenever something fails in the system, people end up in the ER. And it's up to that physician to spend the extra time, even though it's emergency mm -hmm. medicine, but to spend that extra time to connect them to care again. And if I'm in any other specialty, I will not be in that front line to connect people. And I think that's what I'm passionate about the most is reconnecting people when they fall through the cracks. So. I've been amazed by you and learning this story because when we first met, uh, I wasn't aware of all these things because mm -hmm. you just, you took over our, the university's Instagram channel and you yeah. just showed us what a day in your life was. And you were smiling and you were studying and you were up early and you were up late and you were around friends and you were showing us your favorite views from buildings and everything else. What is it that that kept that fire alive? Because I can imagine that a lot of people's fire would have been extinguished through all the, the water that was getting thrown at you. Yeah, they, um, there were smiles, but I definitely had a lot of times where I cried and I felt weak and I felt that I can't do it and I can't keep going. Um, but I just pictured myself being somewhere else, doing something else, or even taking a break. And it didn't feel good. It just, it didn't feel good to leave this and um, not be here, not be studying, not be around my classmates, around the community that was created around me. PNW truly became a family for me and support system. And I didn't know 
how it would be better if I took time off and I wasn't here. Because in all honesty, yes, I won't have the stress of studying, but I will lose that support. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to have anything to do and I will be more stressed and I will, it will feel like I don't have a purpose and it would make me more stressed about the future. So picturing myself not having this was the biggest thing that kept me going. I couldn't picture myself anywhere else. And I said, you know, the time will pass anyway and it's good to get it done as soon as I can, make sure that my mom is at the White Coast ceremony um, and go through the process with her than just taking time off and waiting for I don't know what, you yeah. know? For other people, this is why I wanted to sit down with you mm -hmm. so badly is because these stories, again, these the, the trials, the tribulations yeah. of life, the challenges that you face, many times it feels like you're alone when you're facing those things. I'm sure you looked around at your classmates, professors, people around you and thought, none of you are dealing with the things mm -hmm. that I'm dealing with. But in reality, many of them probably had their own personal things going yeah. on in the background. You talked to me about uh, the, the kid who reached out to you and said that he had seen your blog and he'd seen your takeover and how you became sort of a mentor for him. Yeah. For people who are considering a journey like this, mm -hmm. who have the inspiration and, and want to come and make an impact on others, but are afraid that their life is too hectic or they have too mm -hmm. much going on. They can never keep yeah. that balance. Mm -hmm. What would you say to, to them? Um, it's, it's tough. There is never, there is never a perfect balance. And we just talked about this, um, earlier today is that I don't feel like I have a perfect balance. I always feel that, uh, I am not giving enough to school. I'm not giving enough to my mom. And it's just, I have to remind myself again and again that it's all part of the journey. It all adds up it all given to making me a better physician. Um, and there are times where I question why this is happening to me. Like you said, I look around and I'm like, well, yeah, people are going through other things, but I feel like I'm having the worst of it. And it's, it's not true. It's true to me because everybody thinks their experience is the worst. Mm. But a lot of my classmates were going through a lot of things too. And we just walked around and went from class to class without talking about it and the it goes back to medical school will consume our time and will make us feel lonely because we're isolated from the world in a way and life will go on and we just have to live around it in a way if they see themselves doing anything else, if they see themselves anywhere else. And if they can't, then the answer is medicine. Then the answer is them being here. And if they are going through something tough and their life is not perfect, I feel like life is never perfect and there's always something going on and time will pass anyway. And sometimes when we really want something and we have faith that we, were, we are able to do it, things will fall into place. I started second year not knowing what will happen. I did not have a caregiver. My mom's care was still in Tri-Cities. I had to drive there every week for her care and she was not um, fully able to be on her own or even be with a caregiver. I felt like I couldn't let go and let her be with a caregiver and let go of that responsibility a little bit. But I started walking that path and things just start falling into place. And even getting into medical school, it just, it was always about taking the next right step. It's not thinking, oh, when I get to medical school, am I gonna pass renal? No, it was, well, I need to do the MCAT. It wasn't even like, am I gonna pass the MCAT? I was like, I need to do the MCAT. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I was like, well, I need to do this master's program. And when it, when, the idea was presented to me through the master's program, it just felt like it was the next right step. Took that step, 
didn't know if I was going to do good in the master's program, ended up doing good enough to get an interview, didn't know what the interview was going to be like. And it was just like, just taking that next step, doing what feels right, and not thinking about, am I going to graduate medical school and get to my specialty? Because that's just too much. But just taking it one step at a time, one day at a time. These steps have led you here. Yeah. And they led you, that path led mm -hmm. you to what you said was the happiest feeling of your life, mm -hmm. of getting that acceptance call. I don't want to predict anything too uh, presumptuous here, but I have a feeling that that one might compete with white coat when you get to that white coat ceremony after these two years for that moment. Yeah. What are you picturing for that day? Because I can imagine oh. <laughs> getting through all of this, you must have that in your mind as I'm getting there mm -hmm. and these small steps are all going to carry me to that place. Yeah. Um, I will be honest when I think about it. I do get stressed sometimes because it's around boards. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like I have to pass my boards mm -hmm. and it's scary. And I, I think I picture myself there passing boards, being done with my classes and my mom being there and just looking back at it and be like, wow, I did it. Now I can go off to rotations and do what I always wanted to do, which is care for patients. I don't know what it will feel like. Just picturing it gets me all emotional. So I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I'll see you on White Coat Day. I really want to be there to see this that moment. Yes. I imagine when you watched your mom growing up, you saw the, the people that she cared for. Many of them were at their life's lowest point. Yeah. And she brought them out of it. And she has a better awareness than probably anybody of the power of a physician, of mm -hmm. the impact that you can have on a person's life. And she's seen secondhand now the impact that people have had on, on her life. And yeah. So her thinking about the impact that you're going to have on others and what she's done for you and now what you're doing for her. It's just such a beautiful circle that you guys are forming here. So yeah. I'm just really again thankful that we got to sit down with you for this first one because mm -hmm. I imagine that this story is going to connect with a lot of people who feel hopeless. Yeah. Um, I, I feel more hopeful having spoken with you. Oh, I'm glad. It, it's been very rewarding to talk to you about this and get it out there and see how many students connected to it and reached out. Even students that are not here, like pre-med students. I talked to you about how they reached out and they were inspired by the story. And I didn't know that it would have this impact. And it felt weird sharing it because part of it, I didn't want to use it as like a marketing tool mm -hmm. in a way, sure. but it wasn't that at all. It was just me telling my story and connecting to people who think their life is not perfect and think they can't do it because all those things are going on in their life. And the reality is the opposite of that. Once you start taking the steps, you'll just find support, especially at PNW. <laughs> yeah, and there's such power in sharing this story. Again, this is something we talked about on the phone, but mm -hmm. so many people think and I'm sure I've felt this way myself yeah. that nobody else is going through this I'm not fit for that because mm -hmm. I'm I'm stuck here mm -hmm. I, I can't get through that moment but when yeah. they see somebody like you who's gone through that mm -hmm. and made it here and still have the aspirations that you have to, to make a difference that's inspiration to me and so yeah I'm really proud of you I'm sure Thank that you're, you You've heard that a lot from a lot of people who found out the journey that you're going through, but uh, Thank you. I just so appreciate you taking the time to sit down and to share this because I think that it's going to impact a lot of people. I really appreciate you taking the time too. It, it's, been, it's been rewarding to me. I loved every minute of it. Good, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>